We are so excited to see you all this morning. I hope you are all caffeinated and ready to go because we have today here a live version of History Matters and So Does Coffee with Joanne Freeman from Yale. And Joanne is a longtime friend of NCHE, former board member. Um, and this, and Joanne can talk a little bit more about how this all came to be, but this is a version of a live stream that has been happening for consecutive 156 episodes. So we are at 156 episodes. So usually how this works is that Joanne and then her partner in crime, Annie Evans, um, will have a conversation We'll have a conversation online about um, the historical context of things happening right now. And so um, here's how this is gonna work. And Joanne and Annie will explain a little bit more about this. So we are, we are on Zoom. We've got the History Matters community, which is from all over the world talking in the chat. And then a couple of regulars who are live and in person here as well. Yes. Um, so a couple of things to note, um, you'll see QR codes around the room. That's the bingo card. There is bingo that is happening while Joanne is talking. As Joanne says certain words, then you can click it on the bingo card and then get bingo. And that's that's what we do every week. And the, uh, for those on Zoom, I think Carolee is going to put it into the chat so that you can play too. Also, you should have gotten an index card when you came in the room. If you have questions for Joanne, so Joanne will talk for a half an hour. If you have questions for Joanne, write it on the index card and bring it up to Annie over here on the table. And then Joanne will answer questions in the second half hour. So without further ado, did I miss anything? I think that was it. Without further ado, everyone, good morning and Joanne Freeman. Hey. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here at 7.30 in the morning. Um, and welcome to, thank you. Oh, you know what? Knock my notes down. Okay. Um, welcome to History Matters and So Does Coffee. And I will explain the mug later on in this episode. Um, as Jessica just said, this is the 156th straight episode, a weekly episode of History Matters, which started at the beginning of the pandemic, um, when my thought was, what can I do and contribute to people as they're all stuck at home as I was? And my thought was, what I can contribute is history and the link between history and current day events. So this started way back. And I, of course, turned to NCHE uh, to be the people who would sponsor this, as they, they have wonderfully done for 156 weeks. Um, so welcome to coming to this first remote and live webcast. You can tell I'm like vaguely disconcerted yet excited. <laughs> That's the report on my, my mode right now. But before we begin and before I begin talking about what I actually want to talk about, um, I'm going to turn to my partner in crime, Annie, who is going to explain the rules of the game. Good morning, Joanne. It feels odd because we are six feet apart, but I now have an official partner in crime mug. Oh, so thank you, Carolee, for that. Good morning. Thank you for being with us either in person or our friends on Zoom. I'm Annie Evans. I work uh, at New American History at the University of Richmond. I've been with this group the whole 156 weeks, usually my pajamas, so it feels weird to be in street clothes with all of you. Um, but I started off as just a regular participant in the chat, and then somehow I ended up over here and been delighted to do so for about a year now, I think. Um, so we have a great um, morning plan for you. Normally when we do this in Zoom land, um, as Joanne said, you guys are gonna listen to Joanne for about a half an hour. I'm gonna monitor the, both the chat and the Q&A. If you're here with us live, you should have index cards. You can jot your question down and bring them up to me. Um, if you're Zooming in with us the way you normally do every Friday, just keep putting your questions in the Q&A. That's where we will look for them in about a half an hour. Excellent. Um, and as ever, those of you who are beaming in online, um, if you want to comment and contribute to chat, um, be sure that you mark to everybody so that 
everybody can see what everybody is saying. And I'll start out by noting, actually, we have the chat going, that for those 156 weeks, we've had a group of people that has shown up every week for 90 minutes of history, which is pretty amazing and has become a community, like a real community where people know each other, like we know way more about each other than probably normal people online with each other would. And so not only is that wonderful and has been wonderful throughout the pandemic, but some of you are here and I'm actually getting to meet some of these people after three years of engaging in conversation with you, which is kind of cosmic. So anyway, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, I'm very excited to be here. Um, so what I advertised that I wanted to um, talk about is fighting for history. Um, and as I often do, I try to do uh, on this webcast, I want to use um, my skills and your skills as historians to offer a context for the wild and crazy times in which we live uh, and to encourage people to have a useful lens with which to evaluate things for themselves. Um, there are many things I love about this community, and one of them is people have different viewpoints, and that's a fine and wonderful thing that we can get together and engage in conversation. But I want to talk about fighting for history, beginning with, not surprisingly, I suppose, for me, um, the founding period. Um, and I'm going to start out by saying something that I probably have said 150 times, if not 155 times. I'm going to make one or two statements here about the founders. And um, as some people probably out there are already thinking, I've said it more than once, there is no founder blob of uniformity, right? People love to pronounce the founders thought, the founders said, and there is not a uniform, the founders thought or the founders said, very rarely. And, and so all alone, if someone declares to you, particularly any political figure, the founders thought, that's a moment to pause and think about what it is they really want you to think by claiming the founders thought something. That said, I'm gonna kind of break my rule by making a kind of innocuous statement which is true. And that is that um, generally speaking, the founding generation were very history minded. That was part of their education. Um, in particular, if you were a young gentleman, an elite white gentleman from the time period, um, you grew up having all kinds of models in front of you of how you should be as a gentleman and what the greatest things a gentleman could do were. Um, most young educated men read Plutarch's lives of the great Greeks and Romans, and, Plu and which went through a number of sort of stellar candidates in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, uh, and why they were stellar and sort of positioning, posing in a way, different models for young people. Um, and what Plutarch said pretty clearly was the absolute best thing you can do for your country is to be a statesman, and the absolute best thing you can do as a statesman is to take part in the founding of a country, right? So we have a generation of people that were trained with that idea. And then all of a sudden, there's a founding happening. And they were aware, right? So when you look at their letters, you see people saying to each other, can you believe this is happening? Wow, you know, I thought I was going to be a school teacher and now I'm helping create a country. So they had this awareness. One of the things I love about this time period, they understood the moment that they were in in one way or another, and they understood the importance of history in this moment, partly because it was a founding moment, partly because just the whole Enlightenment period taught that all of history was this big grab bag of information and your job as a educated person was to roam over the past and find uniform uh, patterns, patterns of science, patterns of politics, patterns of whatever. And if you could determine those patterns, you could suit the present to fit them. And then your world would be so much better than the past because you understood the patterns. So they were history minded in a lot of different ways. And there's a weird self-consciousness to this period because of that. As I'm going to actually now I've already said like three times what I love about this period. I love this period. I do. Um, but their awareness of this as it's happening is just a weird, quirky thing, particularly from these people who didn't assume they were going to be great men of any kind. 
And one of my favorite examples of this is um, John Adams. And in retirement, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had a wonderful correspondence with each other. I totally encourage you to seek that out. Um, John Adams kinds of runs circles around Thomas Jefferson because John Adams wants to talk about everything and let's talk about religion. And Jefferson says, and about my crops. So he's not necessarily wanting to engage in everything, but um, there's a, an older edition of this uh, edited by Lester Kappen, C-A-P-P-O-N, but I highly encourage it. Anyway, in one of these letters, and this is not a direct quote, but it's close. Adams says to Jefferson, can you believe that the postmaster wants to read our letters to each other? Like he sees these letters and he wants to know what we're saying to each other. Like we are significant figures and they, they, they wanna know what we're saying to each other. And then Adam says, those of you in the future who may be reading this letter. <laughs> it's like, yeah, he already is addressing posterity on paper. Right? He knows they're gonna be a founder. Now, um, from the very beginning, people wanted to contain and frame and log and um, address in one way or another what was happening as the founding was going on. Um, one of my favorite, favorite characters along these lines was William Plumer, who's um, a congressman in the early 19th century from New Hampshire. Um, and what's wonderful about him is he decides at a really early point, actually he wanders into a lumber room in the Capitol and sees all of these documents congressional documents that are like under logs and being used, you know, in fires. And I mean, basically no one cares about the documents. And William Plumer is a document guy. And William Plumer in his diary is like, what? Like the history is being erased. So he determines he's going to save the documents and he's going to write the first history of the United States. And he sets out to do this. And he's in Congress when he does this. And he says, you know, this is amazing. I can I can interview people, I can interview Jefferson, I can ask them what it was like, I'm going to write this amazing book. So he sets out to ask questions of the people who were there. Um, and a, a wonderful moment in this uh, is he goes to Jefferson, he explains his task. He was not politically aligned with Jefferson, but he was not a sort of adamant, crazed federalist. So he wasn't in the enemy camp. Actually, Plumer kind of liked Jefferson. And Plumer says, you know, I want to understand your view of the politics that you've experienced in your life. And generally speaking, the founding of the government, I'm going to ask you questions. And after the meeting, Plumer goes and chats with John Quincy Adams. And he says to John Quincy Adams, you know, that interview was really strange because I kept asking him questions and Jefferson's face kept changing. Like he looked please. And then he looked worried. And then he looked fearful. And then he looked engaged. And then he looked fearful again. And what was going on? John Quincy Adams says, oh, he was remembering his political career. <laughs> so it was good. It was bad. Uh, and, and that really does tell you something. Plumer never actually wrote that history because, um, and I'm sure many of you here can identify with this, he kept backing up um, to figure out where to start. And, and I swear he ended up with hieroglyphics. Because <laughs> I like, want well, to understand this, you have to understand this. Well, wait, to understand this. Um, so unfortunately he never got through. But um, the larger point here has to do with that they're history minded. And as the founding-ish era began to move into another era, there was a kind of history war that broke out. And this really relates to what I wanna talk about today, and I'm gonna bring it at the end back around to the present. So beginning in the early 19th century, prominent political figures begin writing biographies, histories. They're very excited because they have primary evidence, which they don't call it that, but they're very excited about that. So one of the early contenders in this is by Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall. He writes a five volume biography of Washington. Uh, and he says somewhere in the beginning of it, you know, I'm using Washington's real letters, like primary documents, like this is the real thing. And Jefferson, everyone is, of course, reading this to see what it says. Jefferson reads it. And Marshall, of course, is a federalist. Jefferson does not like Marshall. Uh, Jefferson writes to a friend and refers to Marshall's five volume biography as, quote, a five volume libel. <laughs> 
And he goes on to say, they're depicting us as like office hunters and like, we don't have any ideals and we didn't stand for anything. And so basically it's a federalist biography of George Washington. But so Jefferson now begins to think, ah, I wanna frame what we did. Someone has to frame it our way. And so he actually spends years in his retirement very meticulously putting his papers from his time as Secretary of State, particularly in order, mixing in official papers with little pieces of gossip that he heard, which he thinks, you know, reveal the reality of what's happening. You know, Hamilton just left the room and guess what he said? And that gets sort of swept in. And he thought when he died, this would be opened and it would be primary documents telling the real history of his time in government that would combat that evil five volume libel. So he comes out with that. Uh, Aaron Burr, believe it or not, um, decides he needs to have a stake in this too, right? So he was not thrilled. I, I assume part of what he was not thrilled with was the five volume libel. Um, and so he writes, and it, it's if you were to look it up, it would seem to be a biography of Burr. But when you read the introduction, um, it's clear that Burr dictates a chunk of it to Matthew Davis, who's the the, the author. Um, and when you read, it's two volumes, and it to me breaks down into three sections. I hate Washington. I hate Hamilton. I hate Jefferson by Aaron Burr. <laughs> so that's, that's the Burr point of view of this time period. So um, the main point here, and they're doing this deliberately. They understand that if you can own or contain or frame or tell the story of history and particularly of the founding, you can do it in a way that to you makes sense, that to you is communicating what you want to communicate. And how handy and wonderful is that? Because then people will be on your side and they will understand things your way. So from this very early point, this is a high stakes issue here. They want to tell the story of American history for ultimately political purposes. Of course, they assume as so many people do, right? That their political purpose is a good purpose, but still they are framing what happened in this period, just a couple, two decades before even, they are framing it in a way that tells to them the real story. Very much worth fighting for, high stakes. Now, of course, their history reflects people who are telling this story. So this is a history written by um, elite white men who for the most part were highly engaged in politics in this period. So it definitely reflects on who they thought were important in this period and what they thought was important in this period. But I think that in the current period, our version of a kind of history war is kind of doing the same thing. And as a historian, you know, I think about, um, I think about future dissertations all the time, right? Something will happen and I'll be like, oh, there is a dissertation. Like, <laughs> hope someone's saving that evidence because that's definitely a dissertation. Um, but everything that's happening now in one way or another is so telling about us as is our ongoing conversation, which sometimes is more of a conversation and sometimes is more of a yelling match, but still the ongoing debate about the history of our country and what should be included in the history of our country. So in essence, we are engaged, we are, everyone in this room in one way or another is fighting for history in one way or another, fighting about how you tell it, fighting about what you tell, fighting about, you know, what, how much um, variability and what kind of a story are you telling, right? And if you tell a story, that ignores all ugliness and ignores or denies the bad things that happened in the past or erases things that make you unhappy, that is a, it's irresponsible among other things because the only way we can understand where we are and how we got here and how we might do better is to reckon with the past for all of its ugliness as well as for the ideals that existed at that time. So in this war fighting for history, in this war we're engaged in, you know, in one way or another, it, it behooves us, what a wonderful 18th century word, um, it behooves us, right, to tell a complicated story. 
and, and I think, you know, in engaging in this fight for history, we have a number of different kinds of weapons, which are pretty central. And I think um, some of you will absolutely immediately understand what I'm talking about here. You need to include in your arsenal of weapons complexity, the complexity of the past, contradictions of the past, failures of the past, and ideals of the past. And sometimes I am engaged in interesting discussions when I say something um, about a founder or something that sounds idealistic. And of course, it's very logical to say, yeah, well, that's very nice. But let's talk about what really happened. My response to that is absolutely true. Ideals were stated and they were not met. That fact is important, but the ideals matter too. Why? Because down the pike, people who didn't have enough rights, people who were kept out of the picture, people who were marginalized, used those ideals to move themselves up, to get themselves ahead. So the failures and the ugliness and the ideals and the ways in which they failed, all of those things are in our arsenal that we need to use when we're engaging in this, this fight for history. Now, if you're talking about all of those things, complexity, contradictions, um, ideals, failures, silences, things that in the past have not been included in the story that we tell about history, um, ugliness, inclusiveness, exclusiveness, in one way or another, you're actually talking about the very messy story of democracy and American democracy. That's a really messy narrative, a really messy story. It's obviously flawed. Um, it has moments of glory in it that you can look back and regardless of what your particular political views, find moments that you think, wow, like that was a moment or that was a person. Look at that, that person stood up and did this thing. And so many people who were marginalized for so long and had the gumption and the talent to stand up and make their voices heard, that is amazing, right? So that in and of itself is the story of democracy. Um, if you're showing that bad things have happened and some people tried to do better, that things were exclusive and some people worked for more inclusivity, um, that there are goals and ideals that weren't met, but that there are some people who really hold them valuable, in all of those ways, you're talking about democracy and the fight for democracy. So the fight for history is also a fight for democracy. And that's one of the underlying themes of my, I guess now 156 episodes of History Matters, which is that democracy needs, whoop, is there something happening out there? You good? Excellent, okay. Um, that democracy needs difficult conversations right? Democracy needs people to be able to disagree with each other. It needs debate. It needs a complicated narrative for us to understand, for better and worse, where we've been, where we might be able to go, and how we got to the present moment. So I've talked a lot over the last three years um, about how we really need to think about history and about democracy. Because I think by being history teachers, we are democracy teachers. And we are in a moment where people don't necessarily understand what democracy is on the most fundamental level, sometimes to a shocking degree. Um, I once <laughs> tweeted, this is the part where I become embarrassed because I talk about social media and I always feel like I'm not supposed to do that. And what, what a teaching tool, I have to say, that social media can be. And I tweeted out something, I, I tend to unwisely wake up in the morning and then the first thing I do is grab my phone and then tweet something out and that's so not smart. But um, usually it happens, it goes okay. And in this moment, I tweeted out something like, um, I don't think Americans understand what they lose if they lose democracy. And I got back three kinds of responses. I got back a big bunch of people who said, you're right. I got back a bunch of people who said, who needs democracy? Let's try something else. Like, And I got back a bunch of people who said, we've never had it anyway, so why are we looking at it? And I can't even remember how many million people, like you can go on Twitter and see how many people looked at your tweet. Millions of people saw that, didn't necessarily engage with it, but saw it. That's a remarkable kind of reflection of this moment where 
I think, you know, I was thinking about what people don't realize what they lose when they lose democracy. And I was thinking about some pretty basic things that we take for granted in our lives in a democratic nation. And it became clear that in some way or another, a lot of people weren't aware what democracy is, how a flawed democratic government isn't necessarily a bad government, but it's a government that needs to be made better. And that part of what democracy allows is that, right? Part of what makes democratic government distinctive is that we, the public, matter. That's the, the, the founding generation, the founders said. Um, one of the things that they agonized about was that the government that they would, were founding relied more on public opinion. And of course, public opinion meeting for the most part, white, somewhat elite men, but still they had a greater say in what was going to happen than was typical in most of the governments around the world at that point, which were monarchies. So democracy in a way, anyone who is a teacher right now in one way or another is engaged in a discussion about democracy. And I feel that at this moment, there cannot be a more important conversation about what it has been, what it hasn't been, and what we can be and what we can do to get to a better place. In so many ways, people don't know what democracy is, or so many of us have taken for granted the fact that democratic governance is always there, that it's the norm. And I think one of the things that recent years have taught us is that we cannot assume that anymore, which again, makes teaching that much more important, that much more vital. Students need to understand that they shouldn't be taking things for granted. It'll be interesting to see what people growing up in this moment end up thinking about what they take for granted or don't. But regardless, this is a moment when the teaching of history and the preservation and, and propping up of democracy are very much intertwined. I don't think there's more important work that many of us can do than that right now, is talk about where we've been, talk about where we might go, in a realistic way, including all of the wrongs and the ugliness within the narrative, the reality of what really happened and showing people what the aim was, where people didn't quite make that aim, but where some of those ideals can take us to a better place, to a more inclusive place than we are necessarily now. So I partly want to, um, I won't do it because it'll be loud, but I partly want to applaud everyone in this room because I feel like, and it's part of what gets me, has kept me going for 156 weeks. In one way or another, this is about democracy. It's about history. It teaches things like um, if people, if you read something that the press says or a politician says, and it makes you angry, pause and think about who's saying it and what they might want you to feel. So don't just buy into things, you know, and you, you all know this because you're all teaching this, but you need to evaluate primary evidence, right? You need to think about the whys, why people are saying what they're saying and not just the fact that they've said it. That's the sort of thing that I think promotes a functional democracy of people asking questions, people evaluating political purposes of others and having a smart lens through which to understand what's happening, to understand the aims of people, of different people, and to use that in the way that you're responding to current moments now. So um, I'll, I'll conclude with Thomas Jefferson, who I have to say, um, my, my um, graduate advisor, Peter Onuf, um, probably the one sentence he said more than any other was Thomas Jefferson was deeply conflicted. Peter has a very deep voice. Um, I, and that is true in oh so many ways. Um, but he did say one interesting thing about history. He thought it was vitally important for Americans to study history. Why? Because they needed to be aware of threats to a Republican form of government. They needed to understand what a threat looked like. They needed to know what to stand up for and when to stand up for it. So he, history, he saw the teaching of history and understanding of history was a part of, in a way, not the political process, but the civic democratic process of our government. So for all of these reasons, um, I'm, I'm applauding you without applauding and blasting out the ears of people here, um, but I'm applauding the work that, that you do, that, that we do, because honestly, I'm not just saying this because I'm in a room full of history educators. <laughs> 
but but it, it it it's true right it honestly is what drives me is that i think we what we are doing however we're doing it in classrooms in libraries in archives in museums any kind of public minded work all of it can't be more important than at this moment where what we know and what we don't know can really profoundly shape the future because we are and i'm going to say this and I, people are playing bingo and um, which they have been also doing for quite some time. And there are words I always say, and I haven't said this word yet. There's going to be a response in chat. We're in a moment of extreme contingency. Someone's going to get bingo. Yep, I see. <laughs> we are. They, I, I probably say contingency more than any other word. We are in a moment of extreme contingency when in many ways anything can happen. And we need to understand that and understand the way things played out in the past and understand the ways they might play out in the future. And history is going to help us frame for ourselves and then for others what that means and how we engage with what's unfolding right in front of us. History is happening all the time, but there are some moments in time that, you know, even as a historian, I can say, whoa, like so many things are happening in this era that off the charts historic significance we are in that moment, you, you know, in one way or another, a couple decades down the road, you will be people who, me too, will be saying, wow, you were around when there was like a pandemic and, you know, to make the list of all of this stuff. You were around when all of that stuff was debated and attacked and defended and questioned and some pretty basic things were, were questioned in one way, sometimes eroded in one way or another. Yeah, I was there. So even in that simple way, your being history minded and thinking about the future should help you to think about how you're processing the here and now as well. I see that I'm like two minutes over um, my comments here. So um, let me then explain what was explained at the beginning, but I will explain what's going to happen now. So at, every week I talk for roughly a half hour, which I've just done. And then we have a very lively question and answer period, which is a QA and a period, but is also a discussion, which I love and adore. I, I cannot say often enough how wonderful the History Matters community is, because it's really a community. And for through this pandemic, you know, I started out with like, oh, I'm going to do a good thing. And after a while, it was like, I need the History Matters community. <laughs> I really do. Um, at any rate, um, you can ask questions. Uh, I, I, people online might be asking yep. questions. Um, and then after that, we're going to have, oh, oh my God. Okay. I have to laugh at this because I did it even in front of a live audience. So for 155 weeks, I have had a mug that is thematically related to whatever I'm talking about. I do not own 155 mugs, although the, the collection is growing by the moment. Um, and sometimes the connection of the mug with the topic is a little bit more stretched out than others. But for almost, not every week, but many weeks, I entirely forget about the mug, even though it's History Matters and So Does Coffee is the official name of this. And I start by holding out the mug at the very beginning. I'm supposed to reveal the mug after my comments, which I would have just skipped over if Carolee had not held up her mug. I did it even here in front of a live audience. Anyway. But Joanne, before you do that, we've had a request in the chat. They want to hear the chant from a live audience. Usually if Joanne oh. goes a little bit over, what do we all say, kids? Mug, mug, mug. <laughs> now you may reveal the mug. And that reminds me because I see in chat people yelling mug, mug, mug. And I realize, oh yeah, I would have forgotten it again. Okay. So this is this is a mug that actually many of the mugs were given to me by wonderful members of the community. This is actually given to me um, by a former student who understands me, uh, obviously, as you will see in a moment. And it's related to the fact that I'm talking about the founding generation and I'm talking about history and I'm talking about our engagement in it. And the mug says, let me get it here. In my previous life, I was Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> So it's the founders, it's our engagement with history. Perfect. I don't think I've used this mug before. So I actually was, I was also trying to find one I hadn't used. Someone actually made and gave me this so that I could hide. I was doing all kinds of weird stuff with napkins and bounty towels. And so someone allows me to hide the mug anyway. So um, the mug has been revealed. Now I'm interested. I want to open things up um, and I want to 
have a discussion and hear some of your questions. Do we so, have some? We do. It's, and it was Elizabeth Sheedy, who's with us in the chat, that sewed the mug cover, just so y'all know. Oh, Elizabeth, okay. Elizabeth and, is with us, and she sewed that for you. She did, and it's used every week. And oops, I, upside down, I always use it this way. So this is great. I get yep. to, So I if get you're to. joining us for the first time, you didn't know that this whole community existed, those of you in the live audience who just thought you signed up for a conference and- <laughs> For the world now you're in this community there, so there. every friday we expect to see you in the chat totally but we have a spreadsheet that tells us when joanne has used certain mugs um we have ongoing recommendations for new mugs and carly frequently designs new mugs so there's a whole thing going on and if i can say one thing before we begin with the questions i've heard several people say this to me even just being here one day if you are saying at all oh i'm such a nerd you cannot say that at this place <laughs> because we are all, <laughs> this is the community, right? It really this is. This is the community. So we we are here. We are our peeps. Anyway. And we also do meetups. Like we've had several people who met through this Friday morning get together. And then in real life, they realized, oh, I'm going to be near you. So we've had, a, we had 15 people show up at Monticello one day and we, we did the episode live from Monticello and then we took a tour. So this is a way to make new friends and anyway. Okay. So we have lots of great questions. <laughs> and also um, if you are in the live audience, you've got an index card when you came. So just come around this way. Cause I don't want anybody to trip on the cord. If you come around this way and just put it on the end of the table, then I, that's where I will look for it. I already have a couple. Um, and so I'm going to be taking turns between the Q and a and the index cards. And um, if you bring me a refill of coffee, I might put your question at the top of the pile. Okay, so, and, and in the chat, we have a longstanding tradition. If you find a way to work Bruce Springsteen into the question, because I'm a Springsteen fan, you might get your question an answered earlier too. Um, okay, so our good friend, Dave, who has been with us for many, many weeks, he said, it sounds like the founders had some concept that some of what they were doing or did would be part of history. It seems to me the dysfunction, the cafeteria food fight level, he says, uh, in Congress will be of interest to future historians. It seems that many of those throwing food have no regard for how future historians will view them. What do current historians think about current dysfunctional politicians? Okay, so that's a good question. Questions are usually really good, frighteningly good to the point that I'm like, wow, that's a hard question. Um, this one is interesting because, first of all, obviously we're not in the first food fight politics moment, right? We're we're in a particularly distinctive one, but you know it's not as though there haven't been moments when people have behaved in interesting ways on the floor of Congress or otherwise, right? My my most recent book, um, The Field of Blood, is about physical violence on the floor of the House and Senate in the decades leading up to the Civil War. So, a lot of food being thrown in one way or another. Um, you know, I, I do think there, the founding period is a period where people were distinctive in thinking about posterity to a degree that mostly we don't, politicians don't, we've sort of gotten past time where people do that and think that way, which in a way is sad. Um, but I also think we're at a moment where, and I guess it's re some related to some of what I just said, um, a lot of people aren't historically minded at all. Right. So, I mean, I'm sure many of you do this. Something will happen in the same way that I watch what's going on and I say, well, there's another dissertation. Something will happen and I'll think, oh, wow, like anyone writing history in, I don't know, 15 years, that's going to be in there, man. Like that's that's going to be in a book. That's going to be in a chapter. That's going to be in an article because it's so revealing of this moment. Right. It's so reflective of the moment that we're in. So um, I. I think there are people who are more or less history-minded right now, but I would say um, more important than that, there are people who are more or less institution-minded, institutions of government-minded, um, and that's a big question, um, and that's been somewhat of, of a, a debate or an ongoing attack is eroding um, confidence in institutions of government, and that's some of the food fighting, and that's, again, not new to this period, but that's some of what we're seeing as well. Um, not new but is highly indicative of this moment. And the reason I can say this personally uh, is because whenever anyone does anything bad, meaning bad behavior in Congress, the entire world emails me or tweets me, I swear. So, so you know, during the speakership voting, 
Um, when there was a moment in which, you know, there was a lunge, a seeming lunge, I can't tell you how many people like, Freeman, where's Freeman? Um, so I can certainly say, you know, I'm very much aware of these moments, not unprecedented. Um, and that's an important thing to bear in mind is that so many people are looking at this moment and saying it's unprecedented. There are precedents of one kind or another, right? What matters right now is the distinctive blend of things and how they're interacting with each other and the, the frame through which we see them and understand them. Um, so I'll pause there because I want to hear other questions. Okay, we have so many. Okay, so this is one from the audience. It says, there are so many recent attacks on educators, book banning to curriculum challenges. Given the negativity that surrounds education, what are you optimistic about? Well, okay, so one thing that I have found myself really optimistic about, and, and I'll be interested, I'll be here, I'll be here all day, folks. Um, I'll be here all day, and I'll be curious to hear what you say, but certainly um, in my classrooms, um, the students, and this is particularly true of the undergraduates, understand the importance of being aware of what's happening politically and of the importance of engaging in things, voting, um, having, you know, protesting in one way or another. There are any number of different things that I think students now have an awareness of the fact that it matters in a way that I think in the semi-recent past, they didn't necessarily. So one thing that gives me hope is the degree to which students are really now engaged in what's happening and what they can do about it to a degree that, you know, I, I feel hokey when I think to myself, like, you know, you young people give me hope for the future, but they do because they care. They understand the implications um, in, a, in a sweeping kind of way, in all kinds of different ways, you know, nothing is uniform about the response, but um, that's a huge thing. And, and if you look historically speaking at other moments when things were, you know, there was a moment of chaos or crisis, um, very often it's it's young people protest, student protest that has had a real impact on what happened. So that that's a thing that gives me a great deal of hope. All right. Uh, this is one from the chat. Uh, it says, who is best suited to write the history of the current moment and when? Whoa. Wow. This is one of those like, I know, deep questions. This early in the morning, that's deep. Wow. Um, Okay, well, the, the when question is not answerable. Um, personally, uh, if I were writing about this moment, um, I would, well, I would do, actually, I would do a little bit of what I started out by talking about. Got to have a lot of primary materials, man. You have to, like, certainly ground yourself in things that factually happen. But I think that the most, probably the most, I don't even want to say objective, Books that will at least have taken a breath and taken a step back before digesting this moment will have an interesting insight on, on what's happening in this moment that will be a very different insight from us in the middle of it. So I can't say, you know, in 5.8 years, um, but I think we will be getting a very different kind of book that has a different lens uh, than us living through this moment and that that will matter. But what was the first half of the question was when? Oh, who? Who should write it and when? Oh, man, who? I don't have an absolute answer for that at all. Um, I will say that whoever, well, first of all, I will say that lots of people should be writing, right? Um, and we should be attuned along the lines of what I started out by talking about. We should be attuned to the fact that people writing histories of this period very often will be doing so for a reason and have a particular view. And, you know, I teach this in my graduate classes all the time. When you pick a book up, a history book up and read it, think about who the person is who wrote it, think about their cohort at the time, think about what was happening politically and think about how that shaped this book. So there should be a lot of people writing about what's going on now, but people need to be smart readers. Uh, and th again, this is something I've talked about a lot in the last 155 episodes is, is really thinking about why people say certain things and not just reading them and absorbing it. What's the purpose? What's being said? And why might the person saying it want to have a certain reaction from you, the listener or the reader? So I don't think there's, there's, I, I'm not going to wade out onto the edge of that, that little platform and say, here's who should be writing these histories. I think the best thing um, for democratic politics is to have a lot of different people have a lot of different views um, and a lot of careful readers actually evaluating those 
different views, right? Having having a clash of opinions um, would be good because it will make it very clear to people that there isn't, you know, one easy answer, and that we need to consider different ways in which people envision this moment. However much we might really disagree with them, we certainly need to understand what's driving some people. Okay. All right. Uh, so we have a couple of questions from the audience that have to do with the word democracy, because we've said that word a lot this yes. morning. If it was on your bingo card, you won. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Jeff from California. Do you want to wave, Jeff? Do you want to reveal who you are? Uh, Jeff says, <laughs> you've used the word democracy many times this morning. My right-leaning friends and family continually tell me we were never meant to be a democracy, but a republic. Mm -hmm. Do you have a response? You've answered this. Now, Jeff, you're new, so we're going to let you have this one. But we've answered this one a few times, but we need to keep answering it's it. The kids important. need to hear it. It's important. So. And it's and it's complicated because the, the, the founding generation of people had a very different understanding of what democracy was and what democracy meant. So you even have Thomas Jefferson saying, you know, but democracy is not very wise. And you would think Thomas Jefferson. Um, they thought that democracy meant like everybody is engaging in the political process, not not a representative government. We live in a democratic republic. We have a democratic form of government that's grounded on representation. So I had a, I ha I had a again, unwisely um, Twitter debate with someone over this because people are very, very committed to the idea that we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Um, and when they said we're a republic and the constitution makes us a republic, I said, yeah, but what the constitution creates is a democratic republic, right? It's outlining a government that is grounded on democracy. So I don't know, and I once asked someone, why is the word democracy such a problem for some people? That's an interesting question to ask and to consider. Um, again, it goes back to what I said before when people in one way or another, I think don't necessarily understand what it is. To me, obviously, so, as with so many things in politics, it can be defined in any number of ways. There are things that I think are vital to a functional democratic form of government. And you'll notice I always say democratic governance, because I'm trying to move away from this, are we a democracy or not, which is arguing about words at a moment when we should just be talking about democratic governance. Um, and now I totally need more coffee because I forgot where I was going. Where was I going? Um, is that democracy? Oh, the whole argument about the republic. No, so so there are th things that make um, a politics or a government more rather than less democratic. And uh, I talk about this all the time in the things I write, in the things I say, accountability, right? At the heart of our system is the idea that we give power to people. We give the power. They are public servants and they are accountable to us for how they use that power. It's a very basic, basic thing that, that shouldn't be political, right? It's just a fact. We, we elect, we have elections, ideally free and fair elections, and someone gets voted into office, and then they are accountable for what they do. So, you know, we can have a debate about what democracy is, but there are things, free and fair elections, accountability, that have to be there for something to be democratic in the way it's going. Accountability is the one, I think in many ways we're engaged right now in a crisis of accountability, where in so many ways, in so many circumstances, there's not a lot of accountability for things that, you know, I've had debates with people about um, free speech and people saying, well, I could say whatever I want, wherever I want, however I want. Like, yeah, you can, but then you're accountable for what you say. Right? You can say it, of course. You should be feel free to say what you want to say, but you can't say things and assume that other people won't listen and respond. So accountability, um, if I had a, a banner with a word on it, I don't know if it would be contingency. It might be accountability that I wave around because um, I think people aren't thinking about it enough. And I just think in so many ways right now, um, people, and I'm not, I am not actually subtly talking about January 6th. I'm talking broadly. Um, I think there's so many ways uh, in which accountability has like fallen through the cracks and um, people with power assume that they have power and they can deploy that power, the end. And that's not how our system works or should work. All right. Our friend Francesca, who we love, 
<laughs> our favorite children's book author, Francesca, um, writes to us and asks, we seem to be living at a time when there's a keen interest in rewriting our history to sanitize it. Has this happened before where the present has attempted to rewrite the past? Um, and she she said she thinks Bruce Springsteen sang about that. I think he did too. You guys are catching on. <laughs> and thus her question is being asked. Yes. Um, you no, know, people are always sanitizing history, reworking history, ignoring things, denying things, right? So again, um, this is not a new phenomenon. There are really interesting books that have been written about the ways that this was done in the past over long periods of time in textbooks, right? What gets included, what isn't included, um, textbooks in different parts of the country. Um, the idea of uh, our narrative being really shaped to an extreme degree and, and by that, you know, sanitized, um, things being eliminated, things being not talked about. Um, and, you know, in some way, if you're not talking about things, if you're not mentioning things, if you're not acknowledging that they happened, there is absolutely no way you will understand how we got to where we are. It's just a fact. But that's not new. At the current moment, race is at the center of a lot of the things that are being erased or denied. Um, and, you know, that's the fundamental thing that we should be thinking about is the history in our country of the issue of race, the question of race, the way in which it has affected how people are treated, how it's shaping the current moment, and how we might want that to work better in the future. So um, again, I, I think I used the word irresponsible. Sanitizing our history does a disservice to the country, to me. Um, I think we have to grapple with the ugliness of history because no one, none of us, and certainly our government is not perfect, um, has never been. It's not a, a purely heroic story. It's a complicated story with contradictions and a lot of ugliness in it and ideals and goals. And you cannot tell the story without acknowledging the human component of it, the realistic component of it, the things that actually happened that one might not like. All right, so there's a couple of questions about, like they want tips on teaching what's going on. Um, you guys might know more about that than me. So I'm gonna kind of maybe combine these a little. So Mary Johnson, are you in the audience? You wanna wave, Mary? Uh, this is your question. She <laughs> says, um, how would future generations view democracy if decades of history teachers simply changed their wording from founding fathers to founding generation? Well, so that's actually interesting. Um, historians, so now I'm gonna talk about a historian blob. Many historians no longer say founding fathers. They say founders um, because in so many ways, fathers is problematic. Um, so first of all, the fact that that is a contested way of referring to things, and I think more often than not, um, within the historian community, you will find people saying founders or founding generation not founding fathers. Um, I, I think that matters, right? I think that um, the words you use to describe things matter because they shape, I use the word lens a lot of times today, they shape the, your framing for how you see things and what you are allowing into a picture and what is not in the picture because it hasn't been included in the frame. So I think founding fathers um, is a problem because it includes certain things and excludes certain things. And um, why are we referring to fathers, right? These are not, in a sense, parents, parental figures in this period. They're people who were engaged in the founding of the nation in one way or another. So um, it's a way in which it's another thing I've talked about a lot is that wording matters. How we describe thing matter, things matter. Um, in my last book, uh, there's a member of Congress who stands up in 18 maybe 56, 57, and pleads with other members of Congress not to throw missiles because throwing missiles will mean bloodshed in Congress. And by missiles, he means words. He wants members of Congress to be careful about what they say because their word choice is going to lead to a bad situation. So um, history matters, words matter a lot. It's a thing that as a historian, I love to focus on because so many people don't. And if you're thinking about word choice, why someone is using, even just talking historically, right? Studying in the founding era, the words that people tend to use a lot or don't use a lot, words that 
you know, yes, I have read the 27 volumes of the Hamilton papers many times, um, but I recognize then words that don't appear very often. And if they do, I can then say, oh, why is he using that word? Um, so wording, particularly in politics, I think matters a lot. Uh, and we should all think about it. We should all, you know, be um, discerning readers and thoughtful readers in a way that perhaps we didn't have to be so much in the past. All right, I'm going to take another one from the Q&A. This one comes from Julia. How will social, social media serve as a primary materials for future historical research? Will it be reliable, for example, as letters? Well, that's so that's interesting because we're still in the process in, in some ways, um, the land of social media and the internet is highly undefined. And at any given moment, it's like, oh, someone bought Twitter. And now what will we be saving? I don't know. Um, at, but that's an ongoing question, a fascinating question. I worked for a while at the Library of, of Congress. I was employed by the Library of Congress. And I remember, this is a long time ago, sitting in on a meeting in the manuscript division. And the question that they were debating was, what are we saving? Right, because people aren't necessarily writing letters. Are we saving like, you know, so and so called while you were out? Like, what are we? What What are the documents we're actually saving? And now, in the realm of social media and email and everything else, technology, right? How um, archives confront the technology of a moment and how that's going to shape what we're aware of or not? That's a huge question, right? If you think about, I always say to my students, think about if a um, hundred years from now, someone was writing about you and they had some of your email, they saw, let's say some of your schoolwork or writings. Um, they had a couple of letters for those of us who actually still write letters, right? They had a couple of those. Um, they talked to a few people who know you. They looked at what the uh, activities and things you did over the course of your life. Maybe you even paused to explain how or why you're doing something. How little of you would people know? It would be a tiny minuscule. There's no way that you would be understood in all of your complexity with the kinds of things that we're limited to collecting as archives and as historians. So it's a huge question. I don't have the answer to it. I do think that, uh, and I've written about this before, Technology shapes democracy because technology is a conversation between people giving power to others and the people with the power. It's an ongoing conversation. And any form of technology that shapes that conversation shapes democracy. So the telegraph, huge impact. Why? Because all of a sudden, people say something in Congress and 45 minutes later, the entire country knows that changes how Congress works. It changes how people understand the government. Um, you can walk through history, radio, TV, right? The 1960s and TV and what people were seeing on TV in the realm of protest and how that changed people's point of view. Um, fireside chats, think about that and how people that changed how people understood the government. Social media is that thing in our time. Uh, and it is shaping how our government works in many ways and how we engage with it. And gets us, gets back to the earlier question. I don't know how that story ends or what it says because we are really in a formative moment in which all kinds of things are being worked out. Oh, we are like at the point, aren't we? We have so many questions. Oh, not, we are not going to get to all these questions. Normally, I, we try really hard to clear the deck. You are the master. You are the master I've, of life. I've been trying to combine them. I've been trying to answer some of them. Um, but I, I am going to. Pull this one up. Um, there's a couple more teacher related ones. I know we have a panel later today, so I feel like it's very relevant to what's going to, you all need to come back for the panel because it's going to be great. Um, it says, in our current era of public discourse where gaslighting and double speak are common, I feel like our teaching about everyone's perspective is important has somehow contributed to this. How do you suggest we as educators balance protecting academic freedom while also teaching that that not all perspectives are equal. Well, several words were used there though, opinions, perspectives. So opinions are one thing and facts are another thing and opinions are important. But if you're studying history, it, it, you know, I will look to see the opinions of people in the 1900 and their opinion will allow me to understand that period better. But it's important. And again, I feel like I'm, preaching to the choir, for students to understand the difference between opinions and 
um, things that you were saying happened and that you have evidence to support those things. So that's part of the answer to that. Um, I'm gonna, I see people are leaving, so I want to announce what's going to happen next Yeah. so that you understand this. Okay, so at this point every week, uh, after the Q&A, we have the after party. Um, and what the after party is, is we no longer record. Um, and I always say we no longer record so we can be freer and easier in our conversation as though we're being formal anyway, we're not. Um, but we stop recording and we just open things up to have a conversation for a little while, which is pretty much what we're going to do now is have our after party, part of how we became a community, I think. Um, so I don't know where John is. Oh, there you are. I can't see you. Okay. So um, we are going to segue into the after party. If you beamed in, I don't know if Facebook ever got on, but if you are on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and go to ncheteach.org slash conversations to get into the after party. All you need to do is go there and bingo, poof, I say every week, um, you will be in the after party. Uh, so I hope some of you will stick around because uh, the after party is um, often wild and crazy and almost always fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so John, we've had a couple of requests. One request is they want to see your snappy new haircut. So you have to turn your camera on for a second. John likes to stay in the shadows, but we're not going to let him do that this time. <laughs> there he is. We got John to giggle. I love it. I know. 